Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel where we unravel the fascinating world of cybersecurity. Make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and smash that notification bell so you don't miss out on any future cybersecurity adventures. Now let's talk apps, people. These little squares on our phones, there are lifelines. Banking, shopping, social media, dating, they've got their digital fingers in every pie. But here's the kicker. Ever wondered how secure these apps really are? What if I told you there are ways to peek behind the curtain to see if our data is actually as safe as we're led to believe? Today, we're diving headfirst into the wild world of ethical hacking as we uncover five shocking ways mobile apps can be hacked. We'll learn how these techniques work, why they matter, and most importantly, how understanding them can help us build a safer digital world. So buckle up, grab your thinking caps, and let's get started. All right, first up, let's talk reverse engineering. Imagine wanting to know the secret recipe of your favorite burger joint. You wouldn't just order the burger and eat it, right? You'd try to figure out the ingredients, the process, the magic behind the taste. That's kind of what reverse engineering is, but instead of a burger, it's an app. Think of it like this. You've got this cool app on your phone, but you're curious about what goes on under the hood. Reverse engineering lets you do just that. It's like taking apart a complex machine piece by piece to understand how each part works and how they all come together. Now you might be thinking, isn't that like illegal? And that's a fair question. Reverse engineering exists in a bit of a legal gray area. However, when done ethically, it's a powerful tool for good. Security researchers and ethical hackers use it to find vulnerabilities in apps before the bad guys can exploit them. Think of it like a vulnerability bounty program. Companies like Google, Apple, and even some independent developers offer rewards for finding and responsibly disclosing security flaws. These ethical hackers are like digital detectives, using reverse engineering to uncover hidden backdoors and security gaps. But here's the catch with reverse engineering. It's not for the faint of heart. It requires serious technical chops, a deep understanding of programming languages, and a whole lot of patience. It's like solving a super complex puzzle, but instead of cardboard pieces, you're dealing with lines of code. Now, I'm not saying you need to become a coding ninja overnight, but understanding the basics of reverse engineering can give you a huge advantage in the cybersecurity world. It's about thinking like the adversary, anticipating their moves and building stronger defenses. Remember, the goal here isn't to steal information or cause harm. It's about using our knowledge to make the digital world a safer place. It's about being the good guys, the white hats, the ones who use their powers for good. So if you're fascinated by the inner workings of technology, if you have a knack for problem solving, and if you're driven by a desire to make a difference, then reverse engineering might just be your calling. It's challenging, it's rewarding, and it's an essential skill in the ever-evolving landscape of cybersecurity. Okay, now that we've dipped our toes into the world of reverse engineering, Let's move on to something a bit more hands-on. Let's talk about penetration testing tools. Imagine you're building a fortress, right? You've got your walls, your moats, your guard towers, the whole shebang. But how do you know if your defenses are truly impenetrable? You simulate an attack. That's essentially what penetration testing is all about. It's like ethical hacking's version of a controlled demolition. You use specialized tools to probe your system, your networks, your apps for weaknesses, but instead of actually blowing things up, you're gathering valuable information to strengthen your defenses. Now, there are tons of penetration testing tools out there, each with its own strengths and specialties. But one name that always pops up is Metasploit. This bad boy is like the Swiss army knife of penetration testing. It's got modules and payloads for all sorts of attacks, from simple port scans to complex exploits. But here's the thing with Metasploit and other penetration testing tools. They're incredibly powerful. And with great power comes great responsibility, right? It's like giving someone a chainsaw. Sure, they could use it to chop firewood or they could accidentally cut off their foot. The key here is ethical use. Just like with reverse engineering, penetration testing should only be performed with proper authorization and with the goal of improving security. It's about finding vulnerabilities before the bad guys do and helping developers patch those holes before any real damage is done. Now, I know what you're thinking. This all sounds incredibly complex. Do I need to be a coding wizard to use these tools? And the answer is, thankfully, no. While a solid understanding of networking and security concepts definitely helps, there are plenty of resources available to guide you through the process. 
There are online courses, tutorials, even virtual labs where you can practice your skills in a safe environment. It's like learning to drive. You wouldn't just hop into a car and hit the gas without any instruction, right? You'd take lessons, practice your parking, and gradually build up your confidence. Penetration testing is the same way. You start with the basics, learn the tools of the trade, and gradually work your way up to more advanced techniques. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be the one discovering critical vulnerabilities and helping to make the digital world a safer place. Hold on to your hats, folks, because things are about to get seriously technical. We're diving into the fascinating and slightly terrifying world of code injection. Imagine this. You're at a restaurant, and you ask the waiter to pass a message to the chef, maybe a compliment on the delicious food. Now imagine if someone intercepts that message and changes it to something completely different, something that could potentially mess things up in the kitchen. That's kind of what code injection is, but instead of a restaurant, it's an app. And instead of a message, it's malicious code. Think of an app like a car. It's got all these different parts working together. The engine, the transmission, the brakes. Now, imagine someone tampering with those parts, injecting their own code to make the car behave erratically. That's the danger of code injection. It can completely hijack an app, steal your data, or even turn your device against you. Now, there are different flavors of code injection, each with its own fancy name and method of attack. There's SQL injection, which targets databases, cross-site scripting, which messes with websites, and a whole bunch of others. But the basic idea is the same. Exploit a vulnerability in the app's code to inject malicious commands. It's like finding a loose brick in a wall. A skilled attacker can use that small weakness to pry open a much larger hole, potentially bringing the whole structure down. That's why code injection is such a serious threat and it's something that every developer and security professional needs to be aware of. So, how do we protect ourselves from this digital skullduggery? Well, it starts with education. Developers need to be aware of the common vulnerabilities that make code injection possible and use secure coding practices to prevent them. It's like building a house with strong foundations and reinforced walls. You want to make it as difficult as possible for anyone to break in, but it's not just on the developers. As users, we also have a role to play. We need to be careful about the apps we download, especially from untrusted sources. It's like choosing a restaurant. You wouldn't just eat anywhere, right? You'd check the reviews, the hygiene rating, make sure it's a place you can trust. The same goes for apps. Stick to official app stores, read the reviews, and be wary of anything that seems too good to be true. By being vigilant and staying informed, we can all do our part to combat the threat of code injection and keep our digital lives safe and secure. All right, let's shift gears a bit and talk about network traffic analysis. Now, this one might sound a bit like something out of a spy movie, but trust me, it's more relevant to our daily lives than you might think. Imagine you're having a private conversation with a friend and someone is secretly listening in, recording everything you say. That's kind of what network traffic analysis is like, but instead of spoken words, it's the data that your phone or computer sends and receives over the internet. Think of the internet like a giant highway and all the data traveling back and forth as cars. Network traffic analysis is like setting up a toll booth on that highway, intercepting those cars, and peeking inside to see what they're carrying. Now this might seem like a major invasion of privacy, and rightfully so. But just like with the other techniques we've discussed, network traffic analysis can be used for both good and bad. On the one hand, malicious actors can use it to steal your personal information, like passwords, credit card numbers, or even your browsing history. It's like someone rummaging through your mail, looking for anything valuable they can get their hands on. That's why it's crucial to protect your online activity with strong passwords, encryption, and virtual private networks or VPNs. But on the other hand, network traffic analysis is also a valuable tool for cybersecurity professionals. They use it to monitor networks for suspicious activity, identify potential threats, and even track down cyber criminals. It's like having a security camera system for your network, keeping an eye out for anything out of the ordinary. One of the key things that network traffic analysis looks for is plain text credentials. This is when sensitive information, like your username and password, is sent over the internet without any encryption. It's like writing your PIN on the back of your credit card. If someone intercepts it, you're in big trouble. That's why it's so important to make sure that any website or app you use for sensitive information, like online banking or shopping, 
has HTTPS in the address bar. This indicates that the connection is encrypted, meaning that even if someone is listening in, they won't be able to understand the data. Network traffic analysis is a powerful tool, and like any tool, it can be used for good or evil. By understanding how it works, we can take steps to protect ourselves from the bad guys while also appreciating its role in keeping the internet a safer place. All right, folks, we've talked about technical hacks, but now it's time to address the human element. Let's talk about social engineering, the art of hacking not computers, but people. Imagine you're a con artist and you want to gain access to a secure facility. You could try to break in, pick locks, disable alarms, but that's risky and noisy. Instead, you could try to trick someone into letting you in, maybe by impersonating a delivery person or a maintenance worker. That's the essence of social engineering, exploiting human psychology to bypass security measures. It's like that saying, you can have the strongest lock in the world, but if you build your door out of paper, it won't matter. Social engineering targets the weakest link in the security chain, us. It preys on our trust, our helpfulness, and sometimes our naivete. One of the most common forms of social engineering is phishing. You've probably seen those emails before, the ones claiming to be from your bank or a trusted company, asking you to verify your account information. They might look official, they might even have your name on them, but they're nothing more than digital traps designed to steal your credentials. Then there's pretexting, which is like phishing, but with a more elaborate backstory. The attacker might call you pretending to be from IT support, needing to fix a problem with your computer. They might ask for your password, or even worse, trick you into installing malicious software. And let's not forget about shoulder surfing, the low-tech but surprisingly effective technique of simply looking over someone's shoulder while they're entering their password or other sensitive information. It's like something out of a spy movie, but it happens in real life, all the time, especially in crowded places like coffee shops or airports. So how do we protect ourselves from these social engineers, these masters of manipulation? Well, it starts with awareness. We need to be skeptical, question everything, and never give out personal information unless we're absolutely sure who we're dealing with. If you get an email or phone call that seems suspicious, don't click on any links or provide any information. Instead, contact the company directly using their official contact information. And when you're in public, be mindful of your surroundings and cover your keyboard when entering sensitive information. Remember, social engineering is all about deception. By being vigilant and using common sense, we can avoid falling victim to these tricks and keep ourselves safe from the human hackers. So, there you have it folks. Five shocking ways mobile apps can be hacked. We've covered reverse engineering, penetration testing tools, code injection, network traffic analysis, and social engineering. It's been a wild ride through the world of cybersecurity, and I hope you've learned a thing or two about the importance of protecting our digital lives. But here's the thing. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The world of cybersecurity is constantly evolving, with new threats emerging all the time. That's why it's so important to stay curious, stay informed, and never stop learning. I encourage you to dive deeper into these topics, explore the resources available online, and maybe even try your hand at some ethical hacking in a safe and legal environment. Remember, the more we understand about these threats, the better equipped we'll be to defend against them. And hey, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more cybersecurity content, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you don't miss any future uploads. And as always, if you have any questions or suggestions for future videos, drop them in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and remember, together, we can make the digital world a safer place, one hack at a time.